my name is Peter. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Claws. Uh, Claws is a platform for building what we call smart legal contracts. I'll come on to what I mean by a smart legal contract uh, in this half an hour session. Um, really, what I want to do is um, talk about smart legal contracts through a series of four questions. So, what are they? Why should they exist? Or why do they exist? How can I build a smart legal contract? And what's happening? Now, are, are, they, are they useful? Uh, what work is being done, particularly by Claude and others in the smart legal contract space? So for the first question, what are they? Um, if we look at smart legal contracts from the context of what has happened over the past 30 odd years in, uh, in contract technology, we've really moved from recording smart legal contracts and the ability to, um, sorry, recording smart legal contracts um, uh, in text, uh, being able to edit that text, then being able to sign uh, that contract online. Um, and now we're at this sort of fourth stage, which is being able to move a contract from just natural language text to, uh, to computable uh, artifacts. Um, so today, contracts are, as I say, just natural language text. They're text on a page, so typically rendered as PDFs. And obviously, we can e-sign those PDFs using DocuSign and HelloSign and a bunch of other uh, services. And that's very useful. It means that we can reduce the time to get a transaction uh, initiated, but it doesn't really go all the way. What would be really useful is that if our contracts could actually uh, be analyzed as a series of structured data objects, so we actually know what's in our contracts. And we can do some really interesting things once we've got this, uh, this machine-readable representation of a contract, because we can start to interact with it in ways that we can't today. So if we think about what we do with a contract today, we typically render that in a, in a PDF and try and understand it after the fact. So we use tools like AI and NLP to be able to understand what is in that contract. But wouldn't it be more useful if we could actually understand that uh, sort of ex ante? Uh, so we're able to understand what the contract is when we sign it and through its uh, various stages in the life cycle. So what we're talking about here with smart legal contracts is the ability to turn what is currently natural language text into machine-readable data objects that we can send events to and receive responses from. So what do we mean when we define a smart legal contract? Well, a smart legal contract can be related to a smart contract in the blockchain sense, but doesn't need to be. Um, so a smart contract in the, in the blockchain sense of the term is essentially a piece of code, a script that exists upon a distributed ledger that we can interact with in some way. Bitcoin being the uh, archetypal example, right? We can perform currency transactions using very simple smart contracts on the Bitcoin blockchain. But a smart legal contract is a bit different. A smart legal contract is a contract that is enforceable at law and may have natural language components as well as computable components. And this is really important. This means that we can move beyond, or we need, we need to move beyond um, just smart contracts that exist on chain because there's a bunch of things that we can't do with uh, just computer code that exists uh, on a blockchain. So, and the reason for this is essentially that when we talk about Bitcoin uh, smart contracts, what we're really doing is bundling the computation of state to that contract uh, and the enforcement of state together. So that's really useful for a bunch of use cases. So I mentioned Bitcoin there, it's very useful um, for cash transactions. We don't want to be able to compute the state of a cash transaction and then be able to reverse that. So it's really useful for uh, self-execution of transactions, uh, immutability of transactions, that we find very difficult to reverse those transactions that occur on a blockchain, uh, and also for transparency. Um, and that's great for a use case like currency, but is it so good for legal contracts? Uh, the question um, I get posed quite a lot is why can't we just uh, use the Bitcoin blockchain or Ethereum smart contracts for um, creating legal relations? And there's a bunch of reasons as to why you don't want to do that. And the reason is that bundling computation and enforcement of state together is not very useful for um, generalized commercial transactions. And the reason for that is because humans are hard. Um, contracts and commercial transactions don't always go as planned. So there's questions around um, choice and commercial expediency. Do we want to enforce the state of a, uh, a contract as it's computed all the time? Um, my, uh, my answer for that would be no. Uh, 
Um, there are certain instances um, where we don't want to, for whatever reason, um, enforce a particular uh, provision within a contract. There's also issues of what happens if um, a contract is vitiated. So what happens if there's a mistake, for example, mistake over the, uh, uh, the subject matter of a particular contract. Um, we don't necessarily want to then enforce the state of that, uh, of that contract as, uh, as negotiated. There's also issues of completeness. Um, so Oliver Hart's uh, Nobel Prize winning work. Can we actually, um, are, or are we able to, uh, to know all the states of a particular contract and being uh, when we're negotiating it? And the answer is uh, you know, fairly obviously no. Uh, and then there's also um, this issue of what we do with the state. Do we want everybody to see all of the, all of the state transitions um, and uh, everything that goes on within a contract on a, uh, on a blockchain? Probably the answer is, is no. We only want certain things to be visible on a blockchain. Uh, and then there's also the, uh, uh, the other aspect, which is human readability. Um, so if, can I comprehend every single smart contract that's written? No, I'm sure most people in this room uh, could do a good job at it, but, but wouldn't necessarily succeed 100% of the time. But we can kind of understand um, uh, you know, legal contracts as, as, as they're written. They're, they're written in natural language, they're made with legalese, which is very difficult for us to, to comprehend, um, but we can understand the words on the page. That's not necessarily the case with, uh, with code. So we need to have a human readable element within these contracts so that a machine can understand them to perform these transactions and, and can compute state, but also that we can understand them. And then there's also issues of dispute resolution. So what happens if a transaction is performed and we want to reverse that transaction or there's a dispute over the, uh, the terms of the contract? These are all very important points that mean that we don't necessarily want to bundle uh, the computation and enforcement of state together. So there has to be a better way, and in our view there is. So what we want to do is we want to unbundle this computation and enforcement of state as a default. It's not a binary choice between computing a contract and having it uh, executed in a trustless manner. There is a, there is a, a happy medium between the two. Um, we want to enforce the computer state when it makes sense. Um, and that isn't every single, uh, you know, every single contract that we enter into. Um, so, and there's also a question of, are we enforcing state between the parties, or are we just doing this in an intra-party manner? So are we using um, computable contracts to perform transactions internally that don't necessarily need um, a counterparty to be privy to? Um, and there's also questions, can we rely upon uh, existing institutions? So um, it, is, it, uh, is it useful to have a computable contract um, that can enforce itself if we're, uh, if we're looking at large value transactions or if we're looking at micro transactions? You know, in my view, I think that it's very useful for micro transactions because the, uh, the cost of enforcing them is probably greater than the value of the contract in the first place. Um, and then there's questions of how we use blockchain. So do we use blockchain to execute transactions from end to end? Or, or do we use it as, a, as an evidence layer? Can we compute the state of a contract uh, off-chain and then perform some form of uh, a proof function to share the state of that computed contract on-chain? Um, and then you kind of need ways to mitigate the purported benefits of blockchain in, a, uh, in, in an ironic way. Um, so you need this flexibility in smart legal contracts. You need to be able to um, not necessarily be, have the state of a contract computed in the course at the same time. And then dispute resolution, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, so the value of a smart legal contract, which is essentially a, uh, uh, a contract that's both human readable and machine readable, is that we can understand the content of our contracts. We don't have to, as I mentioned, reverse engineer our understanding from a PDF or Word document, a string of text. Um, we can actually model the contract in a structured manner that we can understand, and I'll come on to what that actually looks like shortly. I can understand the state of my contracts, which is really important. Today, we kind of, uh, we, uh, we edit the contract, uh, we sign that contract, and then our understanding of that contract effect effectively falls off a cliff. Um, because we've got all the data from the, the collaborative editing phase, we've got all the data from the, uh, the signatures of the audit trail that comes with a lot of uh, e-signature services like DocuSign. Um, but then we store that in Dropbox or in our email inboxes or some other service, uh, and we don't really know what the state of that contract is. 
So being able to interact with a, uh, a contract in a, uh, in a computable way is very valuable, and I'll come on to some examples of what that looks like shortly. It also means that we can drive external operations on, on, uh, on platforms that we use. So we can have a, uh, a computable contract, for example, that we can send events to. So uh, Esther was talking uh, about uh, temperature and humidity conditions in a, in a shipping container. You can actually expose the, that data from an IoT platform to a, uh, a smart legal contract that will be able to calculate whether that contract has been adhered to or not based upon that exposed data. And then you can compute things like uh, the price that's payable under that contract using those events. So that's really useful. It means that our contracts are no longer detached from the other web services and software that we use. We're able to bring them together as part of our IT infrastructure. And once we've got all this data, um, so we can actually understand the contract, we, we know the state of a contract at any given point in time, and we can uh, reconcile a contract with external systems, we, can, we then have a lot of data that's very, very useful that we can analyze. So we know exactly what has happened after the point of signature, and we can use that for descriptive and predictive analytics, for example. So now we come on to how, which is really the, uh, the meat of what I want to get onto, which is what is a smart legal contract and why should I care about it? How can I build one? Um, so John uh, mentioned the Accord project in the introduction there. Uh, the Accord project was founded by Clause. It's the, uh, the largest open source project dedicated to smart legal contracts in the world. Um, it is, as of June, part of the Linux Foundation. So it's a top level project alongside uh, Hyperledger and Node and a bunch of other um, really innovative and, and high profile technology projects. Um, it's entirely uh, open source and non-profit. The idea behind the Accord project is to create uh, effectively a dot dot format for what a smart legal contract is. So if we think that we're adding a data layer into what have hitherto been natural language uh, contracts, we need some form of standard as to how we do that. Otherwise, everybody's going to be building smart legal contracts in different ways, and it just adds another layer of complexity and actually reduces the, uh, the benefits of using the technology in the first place because everybody says, well, why do I care? I've got to uh, agree on the format of a contract. I can just do it in Word and share that, and you can open it in whatever word process you want. Uh, we want to get away from that and obviously have a standard representation for what a smart legal contract is. So that's what the Accord project uh, seeks to do. And you can go on accordproject.org and read about all the projects and there's open source code. And um, you'll be able to, to download a, sort of a more thorough uh, 101 than I'm going to give, uh, give now. Um, so now we come on to what we actually mean by a smart legal contract. So in our view, a smart legal contract is a composite of three components. That's natural language that we use today. So legal prose uh, that we can all understand or try and understand. Um, a model, so a data model that actually um, takes variables, and I'll come on to what that means shortly, uh, from the natural language um, and enables us to create that structured representation of the contract. And then uh, executable logic. And the executable logic is what turns a, a, a legal contract uh, into a smart legal contract. And I'll come on to how these, uh, these three uh, components uh, interrelate and work together shortly. What this enables us to do is these three components we can package up together in something that we call smart clauses. So a smart clause is very much like any signature block that you would instantiate within uh, a PDF or, 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 or legal contract today. But instead of signing it, you can actually provide any arbitrary logic to sit behind it. So what we can do is uh, we can expose, for example, in, uh, uh, in this example, this is the one that Esther was actually talking about earlier, which is uh, being able to track humidity and temperature conditions uh, from an IoT platform, expose that data to this smart clause that's running uh, in, this, uh, in this contract, um, and then be able to compute the state of this, uh, of this provision and also any side effects that, uh, that you would want performed on external systems. So for example, you could uh, expose that temperature and humidity data to the smart clause, the smart clause will process that data, it's, uh, <coughs> The adherence to the terms and conditions, um, in this case we're calculating the price based upon uh, stipulated uh, temperature and humidity parameters. We can then actually, uh, after computing that price, use it in external systems. So you can actually uh, output that data to zero or QuickBooks to raise uh, an invoice line item effectively in real time. Currently what you have to do is you would have to have a, um, get the PDF, download that from wherever it exists, whether it's in Dropbox or Google Drive or even email inboxes, 
then uh, get all the temperature data effectively in a spreadsheet, reconcile the two together, and you guys obviously have to do this manually. Um, you would then have to raise an invoice for the finance department, or send it over to the counterparty, who then you'd have to track um, effectively manually as well. This smart course can do all of those processes just by having the data exposed to it. And there are other use cases up there as well. You know, very simple smart clauses that just initiate a, uh, a payment on some event, such as signature. Um, or you can have sort of intermediary, intermediary complex uh, sort of uh, smart clauses where all we're doing here is essentially getting a delivery event, so it could be a FedEx event, and checking whether the, the delivery is late or not. And if it is late, there are, there are price implications for that. And you can go to smart clauses of any arbitrary complexity. These are very basic uh, sales contract examples, but uh, I'll show you some others later on that are uh, a bit more complex than this. And this is what we're really doing here, is that we're moving from text to data to staple management of a contract. And in this diagram, what we're seeing here are the, uh, the guts of what a smart legal contract is actually doing. So uh, I'll come on to explain what these components look like uh, shortly, but essentially what we're doing is we're taking a contract template, so a template for a contract we use today, we're uh, extracting from that uh, contract parameters, so essentially a, uh, a, a variable that exists within that, that contract, so penalty percentage, for example, what is the, um, what is the penalty percentage we're applying to make delivery? We're assigning a value to it, so in this instance, 10.5%, and this is great because we can understand exactly what is in our contract just from this uh, uh, machine-readable representation of what is otherwise a natural language contract. But then the really interesting thing is that we're uh, submitting this to a runtime. So we can actually send data to this contract, receive responses from the contract. So in this case, this is a, a delivery event. Um, the contract is, uh, is using this delivery event to process a response, so a, a penalty in this instance. Uh, based upon the, uh, the delivery data. It then stores the state of the contract based upon this computation that has occurred. So we know the entire history of that, uh, of that contract. And then the really interesting thing is that we can uh, emit contract obligations from that computed state. So we can actually emit a payment obligation, for example, and we can bind to external systems. So uh, I'll show you an example of actually binding that to, uh, to Stripe shortly where um, you're actually connecting your contract up to these external systems using its computed state. So the important point is that we're moving from just natural language text on a page to being able to understand that as a machine-readable object or series of machine-readable objects to actually a stateful version of that contract. Um, so how do we get that? Um, well, there's sort of four steps. Um, there's uh, the contract text that we have today. Uh, contract text and adding these variables, so making that a structured object. Uh, we're then able to add that execution logic uh, on top of that, so we can make that agreement quote unquote smart. Uh, and then the interesting, the uh, sort of final interesting thing is that we can use this execution logic not just in the cloud, uh, not just on resource constrained devices like IoT devices, uh, but we can actually run that on blockchain systems. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to dive into a, a bit of a run through of how these steps actually evolve and the, and, the, and the value of each of them. So, this is contract text, this is what we use today. So, this is contract text and adding variables within it. So, you see, it's, it's very similar to the automation systems that you would use today. All we're doing is simply denoting that uh, we have a variable within the contract by using a very simple markup. Um, this is common for sort of mail merge, uh, stuff within Word, or creating contract express agreements, uh, you would have some form of markup so that you're able to pass this text and understand the bits that are effectively valuable and the stuff that's just uh, uh, encapsulating text. Although it is important obviously for legal reasons, but for, for the machine it's not so important. And then what we do is we bind uh, those variables to types, data types. So the machine can understand what should go within that, that variable placeholder. So in a penalty percentage uh, example, we're, we're using a double, um, so essentially a decimalized value you can put in there. And you can have uh, more, sort of more complex types 
So you can have kinds of types for buyer and seller, for example. But what all we're doing here is we're um, we're creating that that version of the, uh, of the of the text, but in a structured way, so that a machine can understand uh, what these values are within the uh, within the contract text. And then what we're doing is we're taking those variables that exist within that data model and we're writing some logic around it. Um, so you see here, for example, penalty duration we defined in the, in the model here uh, is then uh, manipulated by uh, the logic that we can write to make that agreement quote unquote smart. Um, so what we're actually doing is we're creating a tight coupling between the natural language on the one hand and the executable logic on the other hand. And then we're also enabling you to, uh, to admit these obligations as I mentioned. So what this script is, is effectively doing here is taking in um, those events, those delivery events, calculating the price based upon those delivery events, and we're using a, uh, a penalty cap here so that we don't go above a certain percentage of the total value of the contract. And then we're admitting an obligation at the end of that saying that this is the price that uh, but, uh, um, the buyer has to pay under that, uh, under that contract. So all of this is bound to the, to the data model and to, the, uh, and to the natural language, and that's what gets us the smart clause that we can reuse again and again and again across all of our contracts. Uh, and what's really useful, as I say, is that uh, this isn't a self-contained um, little piece of computation. We're actually able to use uh, a variety of external systems to map these obligations and other, other events that are emitted by the contract too. So this will be very interesting, obviously, and very useful for us to understand what the state of our contracts are. Uh, but one of the big problems within organizations is the fact that we can't understand um, what's in our contracts, but also how we can use that data in external systems. So what we do at Clause is uh, you can actually bind the output of these contracts to any web service that you currently use. So you could send notifications in Slack, for example, when an event occurs under a contract. So when a price is payable under that, or when a, uh, a payment is, uh, is due under a particular agreement, you can emit that as an obligation and send a notification to somebody in Slack. You can actually update the state of Salesforce records um, from, uh, from sales contracts. You can hook in uh, Zapier, for example, so you can queue up any sort of workflow that you've, uh, that you've defined. You can make payments, as I'll show you shortly in, in Stripe. You can actually connect it to Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric. Um, you can sign these agreements to trigger all of these inventions in DocuSign. You can uh, send data back into ERP systems like Workday, for example. You can actually get notifications in your calendar in real time. So when a delivery was made, for example, you can see that event uh, within your, your Google Calendar, but you could also use Outlook and, and others. What's really interesting is that you have this audit trail of all these events that have occurred in a, in a smart contract. So whereas before we kind of understand what happened just up into the signatory point, so when that contract is signed, what we're actually able to do is understand what happened after the point of signature. So we're able to see that a computation uh, occurred within an agreement, that a, uh, a price was, uh, or a payment obligation was emitted from a contract. Um, and, and all of this data we have to manually create today. But using a smart clause in a contract, we can actually uh, calculate all of this data in real time. So this is an example of actually binding a smart clause, a very simple payment smart clause to, to Stripe. Uh, what we're doing here is you see all the Stripe transaction data, but you're actually able to trigger this Stripe transaction using all of the data from the smart clause. So what we're doing here is binding a payment from a contract in real time. So you can see, for example, here's the clause ID, a unique uh, uh, identifier for the, the clause, the smart clause within that contract. The actual a unique identifier for the contract ID that, that houses that clause. Uh, and also all of the transaction data uh, relevant to that uh, relevant to that, pay, uh, that payment emitted by the uh, by the smart clause. So, what about blockchain? Why is this this interesting? We're at a blockchain conference. I've mentioned it a lot, um, and the reason is, is that you can start to perform these transactions across uh, various DLT systems. So you can actually um, store state 
on quarter, for example, so I compute at the stage of a contract, I've got a payment obligation, I can instantiate that payment obligation on quarter, on fabric, on Ethereum if I want to, I can actually trigger um, digital transactions uh, from, uh, from the contract state and the contract obligations that are emitted. So uh, say it's a, a payment obligation, um, you could actually uh, trigger that on, uh, on quarter, for example. There are a lot of interesting tools for, um, uh, for financial applications. Uh, you can bind that to a, an ERC20 token transfer on Ethereum. Say. So if you want to transfer tokenized title uh, under, a, uh, under a smart legal contract, you can do that. And the really interesting thing is that it, to, to use this across all of these DOT platforms, we're not rewriting the contract at all. We're using the same smart clause that existed before, but we're able to bind it to all of these, uh, all of these different systems. And that's really important. If we want to write a, uh, a contract that works on top of Porter, or we want to write a contract that works on top of Fabric, we don't want to have to change the content of the contract every single time. What we're doing here is we're actually just taking that smart clause and saying, I want this data to exist um, on Porter, for example, or I want to trigger this particular um, piece of, of code that runs on Ethereum for this asset transfer. You don't have to do any complex changes to the, uh, the actual smart legal contract or the smart clause itself. So here's an, here's an example on, uh, on Ethereum. Uh, what we're doing is we're actually storing this data that's emitted from the, the smart clause um, as, uh, as input data to uh, effectively a smart contract that exists um, on chain. So this is a very useful example of being able to create distributed audit trails. Uh, blockchain is very interesting, obviously, for the, uh, the digital assets aspect and, and tokenization of being able to transfer tokens pursuant to a contract. But we can actually do a lot of really, really interesting things. If we just are able to calculate the state of a contract and store that on chain, that's valuable in and of itself. And that's what, so effectively what we're, what we're doing here. Um, so as I say, this is uh, really important for portability across DLTs, the ability to write a contract once and use it n number of times across, uh, uh, across any infrastructure you want. You don't want to have to rewrite contracts every single time. Um, uh, you can execute transactions on chain pursuant to smart clauses or smart legal contracts, or you can store audit uh, data on chain. And this is really important: is this flexibility to use blockchains in the way that you want, not being bound to use this uh, uh, this idea of, uh, of computing state and enforcing state uh, simultaneously. You want to be able to do certain things off chain and certain things on chain when it makes sense for the use case. So um, I'm just going to wrap up by talking about how how this is being used. Um, today, because that's what everyone wants to know, right? Uh, they don't just want to talk about hypotheticals, they want to talk about how it's, it's actually being used. Uh, so earlier this year we announced uh, a partnership with, uh, with DocuSign. Uh, they also invested in, uh, in Claws um, in, in Q1. Um, and what's really interesting here is that um, I'm sure a bunch of you have used uh, DocuSign before um, for tagging documents and being able to drag and drop these uh, is these signature components within a, uh, within a PDF. What we're doing here is we're actually augmenting these tags as smart clauses. So we're exposing DocuSign tags as a smart clause that you can drag and drop uh, into a PDF. Uh, and this, this use case is um, dragging and dropping a smart clause, or two smart clauses in this instance, into a PDF to calculate whether somebody, uh, the signatory of this agreement, has valid uh, insurance to drive, uh, and a valid uh, driver's license in real time. So instead of having to perform these, these manual processes to check alongside them signing the contract, we can do that all through the contract itself. So just one interface, one workflow. Um, so this is the natural language text of the smart clause we've seen rendered on, on, on screen here. Um, and if you flick behind, you can actually see the, the code that's running in the, uh, in, in the background. So this is, these are obviously the two components that I mentioned before. The, uh, the natural language and the uh, and the logic. You don't see the data models um, because we don't need to expose them to the uh, to the end user. Um, and then what's actually happening is we're calling out uh, to uh, to various services. It could be any API. Um, in this instance, we're calling out to the DMV to check that they've got a valid driver's license and their insurer to check that they have um, all of these credentials. So no more accidents, no more than two accidents in the past three years, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We're getting all of this data from uh, their insurer in real time. And what we can actually do is condition signature 
based upon this data. So, for example, you could, it, that's really useful for compliance, right? that's the provisions of, uh, and the like. So this is what we call verified internal, this ability to condition some event based upon the computed state of a contract. So another really interesting um, example, I think, is uh, one we did with Clyde Co. Um, so uh, a law firm predominantly based in, uh, uh, in the UK. Um, and this is a smart clause, a series of smart clauses uh, for calculating um, insurance coverage in real time based upon uh, solar conditions. So what they, actually, what they wanted to do was to be able to check weather data in real time to see whether they needed to insure or reinsure against the underproduction of uh, electricity in a, in a solar farm. So you're seeing on the right hand side here uh, the parameters, the variables that I mentioned before within the natural language. So fa fairly simple um, and we're actually then exposing uh, weather readings to the smart cores and, and, and calculating um, claims from the smart cores in real time. So this is a, an example of parameter insurance. Uh, and this wasn't really possible before, um, uh, before you had smart clauses because you had to run so many processes in parallel that it didn't really make it um, uh, economical to do. So here we see the, the output of that, uh, of that smart clause. It's actually rendered in a, in, in a spreadsheet, so a very simple use case, but you can actually add this to a, to a blockchain if you wanted to so that you can see everyone in a business network can see uh, what has happened uh, under that contract. So we're here calculating um, whether it's been a, a, an adverse day, the, the date, the actual weather reading, and what impact it has based upon the terms of the, the contract. So you see, once we get down to zero adverse days, uh, we start to generate claims. And that's really it in a nutshell. That is what a smart, so, I was just gonna ask, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of data built into like the triggering event, and like was it your team who sat down with both sides and like figured out what data points would drive those trigger points, or did they do that in stuff? Like, what did that conversation look like, and how how long did it take? I guess. Yeah. So you obviously, in order to build on these smart clauses, you, you do need engineering capability in order to write the logic. Um, but that's fairly standard um, sources of data for the, for the weather reading. For but example. I mean the process of deciding what data would actually drive the trigger point, right? Like, so it was so the weather, they, but like, you know, coming to like, well, it's this weather event that, that triggers, like, what is that process of? Like? So that, that was essentially a, a legal engineer, right? So somebody within the law firm sits down and says, well, I want to, to use these events within the, within the contract, right? It's, this is a good example of actually using a smart legal contract in what we would say an intra-party sense. So we're not actually executing a transaction between the parties, we're just binding a workflow into a contract to compute, uh, to compute this state. And then you could send that claim over to the counterparty in a, in a manual manner as you, you would do today. But the good thing is, is that we're actually able to compute this in one workflow rather than having sort of three or four um, in parallel. Yep. How much of the... Uh infrastructure for this is decentralized versus goes through a central API that's uh, managed by you or by someone else? Yeah, good, great question. So, this, this diagram here. So the, the, the interesting thing is that you can embed this runtime anywhere you want. So you can embed it on a resource constrained device. So in the, the IBM example that the last gave you, you can actually embed this within the IoT sensor in the shipping container if you want to. Um, you can embed it within cloud infrastructure. You can also embed it within the node of a DLT um, platform if you want. So the, the good thing is it's entirely portable across, um, uh, across form factors. So if you just want to use this internally to compute the state of agreements, just like we've done in that insurance example, where you don't need to execute a transaction between parties, you can use this just in a cloud, your own cloud infrastructure. But if you want to start to execute transactions between the parties, you can hook this up just as a, a, an outbound API to, um, to an external service 
so that you can run it you know, uh, on, on Fabric or Ethereum or Corda. So you can have this hybrid architecture between a, uh, an off-chain smart contract with computing the state and actually enforcing that state or sharing the state on the DLT platform. So the idea is you can have flexibility from one end where you don't use any blockchain at all to the other end where you're using uh, blockchain for the, the computation and the state enforcement. And then some, what we think is the, you know, the really interesting use case is where you have some combination of the two. You're computing the state, maybe off-chain, and then enforcing certain parts of that contract on-chain. Either we're sharing the state in an audit trail, or we're, um, we're computing a, an asset transfer that occurs on-chain. Because the, the really important thing in our opinion is to have the architecture as a hybrid, or at least the flexibility to have it as a, a hybrid architecture. And that's the award of... You can use all of this, yeah. So all of this is open source and in Accord, um, much like IBM do with their, their blockchain platforms, we wrap it up in clause and provide you with all these integrations and um, all of the bits that we think are very useful in an enterprise setting so you don't have to go and build it yourself. Uh, all the trails and UIs and all of that, that's clause. Um, but yeah, the Accord project is this, this standard for um, templatizing and running these contracts. And then you do integration work to uh, stand up yeah, so we can integrate with any RESTful service, both inbound and outbound. So these are just examples. You could, uh, if you used Ariba instead of Workday, for example, you could use that. If you use HelloSign instead of DocuSign, you can use that. You can swap these components in and out. And that's really important is because what we're trying to do here is, is bind systems together. We're not trying to replace the, uh, the web services and tools that you use today. We're essentially trying to make them more valuable by providing this, this notion of a stateful document. Um, yeah, any more, any more questions? Because I, I think that's, that's sort of the end. But um, Yeah, I have a couple of questions for you, Peter. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the Accord project and what you're doing with natural language smart contracts is awesome. So, a couple of questions I want you to think about this as you kind of move forward and continue to develop the platform is, one is, you know, I know we had this slide that talked about, you know, smart contract is not law, you know, code is not law. Mm -hmm. but how do you see the integration going with things like if someone declares bankruptcy and you need to look out to the federal bankruptcy record so your smart contract kind of takes a pause? And or let's say you're doing a foreclosure, you have a mortgage document, and you have to say, okay, is someone in the active military duty? So we can't foreclose on it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that, that's one of the, the reasons, in, in my opinion at least, for not executing everything on chain is the fact that sometimes we have exceptions and we need to deal with exception management. Um, and the bankruptcy example is a, is a good one. Um, there are data sources that we can interact with to be able to, uh, to, be able to use that data to perform some contractual event. Um, but if we've executed a bunch of contract on chain, um, we're now in a situation where we may have to, obviously depending on the terms of the contract, reverse a lot of that. Uh, and our view is that that's why you want this hybrid architecture. You want to compute some state off-chain, off maybe store um, data points or proof points on-chain, or maybe even um, form some form of computation on-chain, so a, an asset transfer. But you don't want to have everything on-chain so that it becomes effectively impossible to stop. That's, that's a really good use case for things like currency, right? And, and cash, we don't want to be able to reverse these transactions. But when you apply with wholesale, that's that technology over to, to legal contracts that are sort of a, a bit more esoteric, have a more uncertainty than just a simple smart contract for a, uh, for a cash transaction, that's when we get into this complexity and that's where we want to have this, uh, uh, this hybrid architecture in our view. Perfect. I have one other question for you, Peter. And that's also, you know, as we continue to evolve and attorneys use uh, smart contracts more and more in the future, how do you see kind of the malpractice side of that coming into play? Because, you know, in reality, an attorney needs to know exactly how the contract's going to work for the client. And now we're dealing with code in addition to natural language. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. And, uh, and our view is that we're, it depends what view you take of the code component of a, uh, of a smart legal contract. That, that code component could be part of the, um, the, the, you know, the contractual terms, or it could be, uh, and in the examples that I've given, essentially executing workflows alongside the, the natural language of the contract. So in our view, in a lot of instances, you would actually say, well, the natural language of this contract is binding, um, but what we're doing is we're adding code in the background that can 
perform these operations that we would otherwise need to perform by hand, by you know, manually. Um, so essentially replacing human actions with API calls. Uh, and in our view, that's far more efficient, far more accurate, um, and far more scalable than any human could be. Um, so our, our view is that actually the, um, the natural language takes precedence, and that would typically be the case. Um, there's a bunch of issues of speed resolution and possibility there. Um, but what we're actually doing is using the logic to execute these workflows um, in parallel with the natural language, rather than having to do everything um, you know, manually. Okay, any other questions? Oh, we have one more question. Oh, let's take this question here. Okay, the mic. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so, a related, a related question uh, How do you, how do you keep track of a contract instance? Uh, the output of a contract obviously will affect, or, well, the contents of the contract will obviously affect the output. So, if the uh, obligations change or there's a different instance of a contract, how do you keep track of that? And where is it, uh, where is it stored in a ledger or something to actually reference later? Yeah, so you can, so the, the default is that you store, um, you store this data in wherever you're running the, the contract. So that could be, in our, in our example here, we're just running this in effectively in the cloud, right? And we're able to store this in sort of a, uh, you know, a regular database, MongoDB, for example. But you could also store all of this data within Amazon's new uh, QLDB, for example, so their crypto, uh, cryptographic database. Or you can natively store all of this um, on-chain. Uh, you can store it on both if you want to. It's that flexibility um, that is really, really important in our Right, because the point, the point I'm trying to make is that an instance of a contract is actually a different contract. So now that we have a different instance, you actually have a different contract, so the outputs will be different. How can you tell from one version to the next, to the next, uh, the output for one client versus another client? Or a oh, similar contract. Right, so you have unique identifiers for every single instance of a contract. So essentially what we're doing is we're, we're content addressing all of, the, uh, all of the content within a contract. So every smart clause has got a cryptographic hash, and every contract has a cryptographic hash. So um, you can kind of, you can see it here. So this is the, the user ID has a unique reference, but so does the, the contract ID, and it's not shown on here, but also the clause has its own uh, content address uh, identifier. And what that means is that you can only derive that content address right. from that unique instance of a contract. So and you can re-instantiate a contract if you need to. Let's say the versions have actually increased to a, a version of the line or whatever. Yeah, so it would have to be exactly the same contract to have the same hash. So we know if uh, you know, you're, you've got that template and you're using that five times over, um, you would only have the same hash if that contract is exactly the same in each of those. Right, and that hash is referenceable. Yeah, so you can store that on chain. So that's what we're doing here on Ethereum. We're storing all of this data on chain. So the good thing is, is that you, uh, a content address hash, a cryptographic hash, is, it, you, you can only derive it one way. So we can't actually work out what the, the, the content of the contract is from the, from the hash, but you know if you've got the document that you can, uh, you can check it against the data you stored on chain. Okay. Okay, Peter. Thank you very much. Nice round. Thank you. Okay, right inside for it. Perfect. And next, we're going to have uh, Cooper come up from Hedera Hashgraph, and he's going to give us.